Uh, good morning uh, to everyone. It's February 2nd, 2021. Uh, I'm going to call to order the meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Uh, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. Chair McPherson? Here. Uh, we will now have a moment of silence prior to the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything to say before we have a moment of silence. Um, Chair, you. if yeah. you would let me go ahead and share my screen so p if people need to join us, like they can have that information. Very well. Okay. So welcome to the teleconference, February 2nd, 2021, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisor meeting. Pursuant to the provisions of the Governor's Executive Order and 2920, this meeting is being held virtually. The county welcomes the public to participate in today's meeting using the Zoom link provided here on our website, provided on our website at, Santa, at www.santacruzcountyca.iqm2.com. Click on today's date and then the agenda. You will find the Zoom link there, or you may type it in as you see it here on your screen. If you wish to participate by phone, you may do so by calling 1-669-900-6833. The meeting ID is 811-6828-0214. Again, you may call one 669 nine zero zero six eight three three and enter the meeting id eight one one six eight zero two one four if you need further help logging into today's meeting you may call the clerk of the board's office at eight three one four five four two three two three and someone can help you log into the meeting as always you may watch live the live stream broadcast of today's meeting through the santa cruz county ca.iqm2.com the county Facebook page or through the community TV website. Thank you. Chair, you can continue now, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, we will now have a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, now recite the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, item number three on the agenda is a consideration of late additions to the regular agenda, additions and deletions to consent agenda and regular agendas. Uh, Mr. Palacios, do we have any additions to the agenda? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair McPherson. Uh, we do have some corrections and addenda and also a late request to have a late addition. I'll start with the corrections. Uh, on the regular agenda, item number seven, there's additional materials. There's a revised memo, packet page 11. On the consent agenda, on item number 10, there's additional materials. There's a revised minutes, packet page 20. There's an addenda to the consent agenda, item 29.1. This is to adopt a policy goal to create a collaborative countywide approach to ensure no family with children under 18 years old remains unsheltered for more than 90 days by December, 2021 direct the county administrative officer, the director of the human services department and the housing for health division director to work with all appropriate county staff and community partners to develop and prioritize programs, resources and partnerships to ensure families with children do not go without shelter and to return no later than May 25th, 2021 with a report on the development and implementation of the programs, including any additional resources necessary to achieve this policy goal as recommended by Supervisor Coonerty and Supervisor McPherson. There's a board memo printout as well. And finally, uh, Chair McPherson, there's a late addition uh, to the regular agenda that we are requesting. 
This is item uh, three. It is requested that the Board of Supervisors determine by majority vote that an emergency situation exists as defined by government code section 54956.5 requiring prompt action. Item 8.1 would consider adoption of a resolution establishing a state of local emergency as a result of damage to roads and other county property from the January 2021 storms and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. There's a board memo, printout and a resolution emergency proclamation. So the first item uh, chair that we would ask is that you uh, consider a, a vote to add this item uh, to the uh, agenda. Okay, that's 8.1, right? This, yes, it would be added as 8.1. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll move to add that to the agenda. Second. Okay. Um, do we need a vote? Uh, we guess we do need a vote to add that to the agenda. Call the roll, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. Chair McPherson? Aye. Uh, does that complete your report on the consent and regular agendas, Mr. Pachos? Yes, that does. Thank you. Okay. Um, we will now uh, go to announcement by board members for I of items removed from the consent or regular agenda. Does anybody want to remove anything from the consent agenda? Okay. Uh, item number five, public comment. Uh, this is a time for any person to address the board once during the public comment period not exceeding two minutes. Uh, comments must be directed on, items on today's consent or closed session agendas or regular agenda um, and uh, or on any topic on today's agenda, but within uh, the topic not on today's agenda, but within the jurisdiction of the board. Excuse me. We'll take public comments uh, now for up to 30 minutes if necessary. Additional time will be uh, made for public comments allowed after the last item of today's uh, regular agenda. Do we have any uh, public comments? Yes, we do, Chair. If, if you wish to comment and you are calling in from a phone, please dial star nine now. This will virtually raise your hand. I will identify you by your last four digits of your phone. And when you hear me say the last four digits of your phone number, please dial star six to unmute yourself. Only dial this once. If you dial it a second time, you will remute yourself. Once you dial star six, you may start to speak. The timer will start when you begin. And Chair, if you will give me one second to share my screen to bring up the timer. Thank you. One second, Chair, I'm sorry, I'm having. Why is it not? There we go. I apologize, Chair, I'm having. Uh... That's okay. I think everybody understands. <laughs> Take your time. It's been working very well since the first of the year, so don't worry about it. Maybe it's because it's February. There we go. I'm trying to center this so the people watching can see the timer. And for some reason, my keyboard is not wanting to respond. I see the timer on my screen. Can you um, see the whole thing? Okay, that's fabulous. Yeah, two, two minutes, three, uh, three steps start. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Our first speaker is Corinne Hayland. You have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start speaking. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Corinne Hayland. 
I oversee the County Health Services Agency Oral Health Program. In part partnership with Dante's Community Dental Care, we staff the Oral Got Health it. Access Steering Committee, a group of local experts, community leaders, and education advocates with the goal to improve oral health of Santa Cruz County residents. Supervisor Friend is a co-chair of the committee, along with Dr. Seppi Tagve, Chief Dental Op Officer of Dientes. I'm here today to thank the board for signing a proclamation recognizing this year's four Oral Health Hero awardees. The Oral Health Heroes will be recognized at the upcoming Oral Health Summit held this Thursday, February 4th. The Lifetime Achievement Award will be given to Cynthia Matthews for her decades of oral health promotion as past mayor, Santa Cruz City Council member, and current member of the Oral Health Access Steering Committee. She has spearheaded water fluoridation efforts and advocacy, led the charge for more access to dental services through increased community investments, and has supported a new dental clinic in the city of Santa Cruz. The Oral Health Team Award for Outstanding Non-Dental Professionals will be given to David Brody, Executive Director, and Alicia Fernandez, Health Outreach and Enrollment Supervisor of First Five Santa Cruz County for their steadfast and synergistic collaboration to promote oral health education to families of young children, therefore aiding in the prevention of childhood caries. The Oral Health Award for Outstanding Non-Dental Professional, excuse me, will be given to Noel Helch, Cabrillo College Dental Hygiene Program Director for her passionate promotion of oral health care, both locally and globally, and for her commitment to education and training of future dental professionals. We hope you can join the celebration of our local oral health heroes. Invitations have been sent to all of you for the Oral Health Summit this Thursday, February 4th via Zoom. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, your recognition of that program and uh, to our own supervisor, Brent, for being so involved at uh, Matthews, Brody, and so many others. Congratulations on a very successful and very necessary and meaningful program for the county. Our next speaker is Carol Bjorn. You have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start speaking. Good morning. This is Carol Bjorn. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um, good morning. Um, so last week I gave you all a common sense approach to considering whether a vaccine for COVID is necessary by posing the question, um, why would you need a vaccine for a disease with a 99% recovery rate? I hope you took some time to ponder this question. Today I would like to look at the vaccine issue from a legal point of view with the following question is mandating the COVID-19 vaccine legal? And the answer is no, mandating or requiring a COVID-19 vaccine for schools or businesses or the community in general is not legal. It violates federal law to do so. To illustrate this, it's okay. I'd, we'll figure it out. I'd like to read um, a letter from Children's Health Defense that was sent to all of the superintendents in California. So PCR testing and COVID-19 vaccines are not fully licensed products. They are EUA products, which means they're emergency use authorization products, which by their very nature are, are legally considered investigational. As these are experimental medical products, it's unlawful and unethical for schools to mandate either a PCR test or any currently available COVID vaccine. Federal law confirms explicitly that EUA product must be voluntary because the federal statute requires the option to accept or refuse administration of the product. Further, it also violate mandating um, PCR test or experimental COVID-19 vaccines also violates California state law. It's California Health and Safety Code 24172. Federal and state law on this matter rests on the first principle of the Nuremberg Code requiring that the human subject be so situated as to be able to exercise free power of choice without undue inducement or any element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, or other form of constraint or coercion. This is a bright line test that cannot be blurred. So I just wanted to make sure that you guys were all aware. Thank you. Caller whose telephone number ends in 2915. You have two minutes to speak. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Good morning. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I uh, support 
what the former speaker said completely, and I do not support mandatory vaccinations. It's not a vaccine. She's spot on. It is not a vaccine. So uh, thank you, and I hope that you will, the board will carefully consider that. Um, I want to, I, I'm a little surprised that there was a local emergency declared for road damage. Our county really uh, dodged the bullet on this last storm. And so I want to point out to the board that there is already a storm damage repair on Schulte's Road. That's consent item number 27 was the uh, damage on Schulte's Road uh, related to that, just that it got worse. So uh, I am aware of the damage on um, Valencia School Road, though, and that was I'm glad that PG&E worker made it okay. I want to bring to you the, the damage that has been done to the 5,000 people who evacuated during the debris flow and had no place to go. Supervisor McPherson, your newsletter sent out at 5 p.m. a week ago Tuesday, uh, instructed people to find a hotel. The fairgrounds was not open. Even though the board was told it was, it was not. The livestock gate was closed and locked on Wednesday. There were no animals allowed to be taken by equine evacuation to the fairgrounds at all. There is an MOU with the county to, that the fairgrounds must be available for disaster sheltering. The Harvest Building, in, which houses a kitchen that the county paid for to put in for mass feeding, was filled with a hot tub and spa show. No people were allowed to evacuate and shelter there. This is wrong, and I have contacted Mr. Beaton by email three times, and he's not responding. And mute it. Chair, I do not see anybody else's hands raised. I believe that is the end of public comment. Okay, um, thank you. Um, we will um, look at the consent um, agenda. Is uh, there, Are there any items on the uh, consent agenda, uh, Mr. Koenig, that you would like to address? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to uh, point out item 21, uh, the two-year $1.5 million grant from the Disaster Recovery National Dislocated Worker Program. Uh, it's a great program. I think it's fantastic that we're providing work opportunities for folks uh, who have suffered from the CZU complex fire and moreover, uh, creating opportunities that help to clean up and repair public spaces like Big Basin State Park. Uh, on item 23, uh, the contract with BitFocus, which is uh, for $288,000 a year to provide data for uh, homeless services. Obviously, data is an essential part of our homeless um, programs and services. Um, and I just want to encourage us to get the public facing parts of those dashboards available as quickly as possible. Um, you know, as I've mentioned numerous times, uh, this issue is of top concern to the public. And I think that we need to be able to demonstrate uh, to them as well as to ourselves uh, what progress we're making. So at $24,000 a month, uh, we should be able to do it. And I'm looking forward to seeing those dashboards. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Friend. Mr. Chair, I have nothing to specifically comment on on the consent agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Coon uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a couple of uh, Comments in one additional direction. I'm number 19, which is the FIT, that's the Focus Intervention Team. Um, it says uh, that we would assess to uh, incorporate in the budget, but uh, this board voted to, to provide half a year's funding. So I just ask that we uh, change the direction to incorporate it uh, into next year's budget. Um, item number 20, which is the water resources. I just wanna thank our water resources team between uh, the fire and the debris flow, um, we could have had additional crisis of having uh, the city's and the county's water resources um, severely impacted more than they already were. And the water resources team had a great uh, response and we're, we're lucky that uh, we're able to maintain water service and then restore the water service uh, to the communities that were impacted. Item number 29 is about uh, the tree work that the Department of Public Works did. I just want to take a moment and thank them. They did it in a way that was collaborative and effective, um, and it was uh, ensured the safety and the protection of our infrastructure. Um, so I just want to give a moment of appreciation. And finally, on 29.1, 
which is the late edition uh, that Supervisor uh, Chair McPherson and I uh, added to have a develop a policy and a strategy for no uh, unsheltered local families uh, with kids under 18. Um, this is something I've been working on for a long time. We have a preference from the Housing Authority for Section 8 vouchers for local families. Uh, so there's a path for them to go. Hopefully those, uh, we increase the number of vouchers and with a targeted and effective outreach program and problem solving, um, we can make sure that there are no kids uh, out in the rain. Uh, tonight, San Mateo has a similar policy. And um, in addition, Housing Matters just received a large grant from uh, the Bezos Family uh, Foundation to, to, to address this issue. So I feel like the pieces are coming together and if the county uh, really focuses its efforts, we can uh, we can achieve this goal. And I also just want to take a brief moment. Um, this was a policy that was really important to uh, Allison Ender. She worked on it constantly, um, trying to help kids directly um, who she knew were homeless at night, and then overall shift the county's policy. And uh, I want to you know just just do this in her memory and her honor as a as a as something that was incredibly important to her. Thank you. Very good. Um, Supervisor Caput, any comments? Yes, on thank that? you. Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, McPherson. Uh, I'll just make a quick comment on the uh, here at the shelter at the Veterans Building in Watsonville. Uh, we do have women with children. Uh, I don't know uh, yourself and uh, Supervisor uh, Kunati. Uh, when you say families with uh, children, is that the uh, husband and wife and the child, or the mother and father and the child? Yeah, or 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 a, or a, or one parent. Um, the real point is to to help to help make sure we have no unsheltered kids. Okay, great. That's great. That's about it. Uh, everything's going okay here. Okay, that's good to hear. Uh, I have a couple of items on uh, number 14, the operations plan update. This was a very ambitious program uh, for 2019-21, a subset of our strategic plan, the operations plan though. Uh, I wanna thank the uh, CEO and all the departments who have played an integral role in taking our strategic uh, initiatives and bringing them to life. Uh, I mean, I think that we had 180 objectives 64 are completed, and uh, I think that uh, 44 have been amended, and uh, we, we have a high percentage that we've achieved or are underway. But uh, the challenging events of 2020 uh, will continue well into this year, uh, have necessitated, necessitated um, a review of our operational plan. So I, uh, I, quite frankly, I've learned a lot through our pandemic and fire response that we need to be incorporated into our plan going forward. I'm just glad we have it. Uh, this is something uh, people, we really took an effort as a county to reach out to everyone, include all departments uh, to say, what do we need to do, whether it be in recreation, public health, transportation, what is the needs of our community and how do we address that, those needs and get to them? And we are doing a fantastic job. The interruption of the uh, fires uh, and the, the, the uh, uh, COVID have really put a dent in this and that's why it's delayed. But I look forward to seeing this updated plan in August. And I just want to thank everyone who puts have, has put so much time in this for us to reach the essential and important goals that we have. Uh, I too would like to mention on the water resources report to thank the environmental health for re generating, uh, generating uh, uh, this big, it's a huge report. Uh, it's going to be invaluable for our understanding of our water systems in the future and our water supply. And I think a special uh, thank you for the efforts made to secure and maintain our water quality and supply after the fires. Uh, there's also much work going on outside the burn area to deal with long-term plans. The Mid-County area has done its groundwater basin plan. Uh, I and uh, now Supervisor Koenig are uh, involved in the uh, valleys of Scotts Valley, San Juan's Valley uh, on the uh, Santa Margarita wastewater plan. And uh, we, it's a critical element and I, it's good to have this updated repair or uh, report. Uh, I do want to thank the Public Works Department for managing our storm damage repairs uh, and critical in infrastructure replacement. Uh, that's items 26, uh, 25 and 6. Uh, the nature of some of these repairs go back to more than four years. And so it points out just how long it takes to get the matching funds, to get the plan, to get the environmental review, 
all those aspects to get this done. But we did it, and uh, I think it's uh, we're doing a great job. And uh, my hats off to the Public Works Department. And then uh, on 29.1, I want to thank uh, Supervisor Coonerty for bringing this forward. Uh, the housing for the families with children uh, that are experiencing homelessness, uh, a critical part of this huge issue that we have, and uh, we're going to manage it to the best of our abilities with the financial resources that we do have. Um, with that, um, I would entertain a motion to. Uh, Approve the consent agenda as amended. I'll I'll move. Move. I'll motion. Or I'll second either way. Okay. Moved by Coonerty, seconded by Caput to approve the consent agenda as amended. Uh, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. And Chair McPherson? Aye. That passes unanimously. We will now go to our regular agenda, item number seven. Consider the pre a presentation of the long range facilities plan as outlined in the memorandum of the Deputy CAO Director of Public Works, Matt Machado. Uh, we have a long range facilities plan and I think Mr. Machado is going to make the presentation on this. Chair, it's actually going to be um, Travis Carey. The, okay. If you will give me one second, I will bring him into the meeting. Very well, thank you. Mr. Carey, you should be able to present. Okay, can you hear? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen for the presentation. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes, oh, thank great. you. Excellent, uh, good morning chair and board. Uh, Travis Carey, Director of Capital Projects, uh, Department of Public Works. And it's my great pleasure to present the Long Range Facilities Plan to you today. It's been uh, about a year and a half in the making and so we're, we're really excited to uh, get this plan uh, accepted and move on to the implementation phase um, where we can. So I wanted to real quickly acknowledge the steering committee. Um, that is the membership of the steering committee is listed in the plan. Um, included uh, representatives from every department in the county and some of our partner agencies as well, and CAO staff and, and some su uh, supporting staff as well uh, for all the working groups. So really appreciate all the support there. And I want to also a quick thank you to the Gensler team, our consultant. Um, for their expertise and guidance in creating the plan, especially through our challenges with COVID. This plan uh, was primarily uh, finished up during, during COVID and remote work. So um, that continued with a slight delay, but uh, otherwise um, it's looking pretty good. And um, I also wanted to, oh, and, and I want to mention the Gensler team is listed in the plan as well. And I want to have a special acknowledgement for Peter Detlefs, um, formerly in the CAO's office and now with HST. Um, Peter came in and helped co-manage this project with me and then really took a leadership role when we had some staffing changes and uh, transitions. Um, he took a leadership role with the, the departmental interviews, the facility tours, and we just we had innumerable meetings um, on this project. And he also did a great job helping uh, coordinate the consultant. Um, and so that, that was very, very much appreciated. Um, so with that, let's get started. So here's an agenda for today. I'm, I'm gonna look at the goal and the focus series of the plan uh, briefly. And then I wanna talk a little bit about the fit into the strategic and operational plan um, that Chair McPherson just mentioned. And then we'll talk briefly about some of the limitations of the plan and go over a process map that we used uh, for the plan development. Um, and then we'll get into the actual plan itself. And I'm, I'm just gonna review you know, some of the highlights out of the plan mostly in the property and space um, needs area, and then really focusing on the recommendations. And then we'll talk about uh, some next step projects that, that are in the works and the board recommendation. So here's the overarching goal of the, the project uh, and the, the plan. So um, I'll let you read it a little bit there. Um, it's, it's pretty long. I wanted to point out it's a 20 year plan. So this is a long range plan. Uh, that's why it's in the title. It is a, uh, 
you know, pretty, pretty far reaching. So keep that in mind. And we're setting guiding principles and standards for this. So a few new standards uh, are recommended. And then this is really a framework. Um, and so it's giving us uh, a good comprehensive look at our existing facilities and some good recommendations going forward um, for both facility and some campus master planning. And there's a tie-in with the county strategic plan and the operational plan, and, and we'll look at that uh, briefly in, on the next slide. Um, so the focus areas, we looked at all the county-owned and leased facilities. That's really important, as we'll see later. And then we, we distilled it down to seven priority properties. They're called, they're the largest campuses and, and the, the rural employment centers for the county. And we identified two potential surplus properties. And then, you know, we looked at current and future staffing and service delivery, a really important um, looking at not just county facilities from the staffing uh, standpoint, but, but service delivery is a primary, um, um, you know, uh, study, part of this study. So, um, and then of course, looking for opportunities for con consolidation and more effectively using the facilities that, that we have. Okay, so here's, here's our uh, county operational plan implementation. So the, the um, long range uh, facilities plan is in objective 140 of, of the operational plan uh, for public works. And uh, it was basically the, called campus master plans. And so it's the second component in there. The board did accept the, the first phase opportunities and challenges study, uh, April, 2019. And so now we're looking at the second phase. I wanted to point out the two red X's on, we, we were planning to do a, um, a master plan for the Freedom Boulevard campus, as well as the government center, and then the uh, subsequent environmental review. Um, because of the, the budget constraints, those two elements um, of, of the objective have been delayed. Um, and you know it's possible that could come back at a later date if we can uh, identify some more funding and need there. Um, and so today we're, we're focusing on the long range plan. Um, it was authorized by the board back in September, 2019. And so we're looking today for a uh, acceptance final action. So look, uh, quickly on the limitations, um, it, the plan includes a majority of the county facilities. It, however, does not address jails and, and detention facilities. We did look at uh, you know, the sheriff's staff um, um, when we looked at staffing levels, um, especially at the Chanticleer site. Um, so that was included, but this is not a jails and detentions um, facility. And we did not cover non-county agencies. So some of our sites have county partners in there. Um, that was not a part of the study. Um, just a second, I'm getting an error message here. Um, also does not include uh, parks or the, the parks master plan. The parks department has their own master plan that, that they follow um, for their development. We did look at parks in terms of what the county owns. Um, and we did include again, the park staff and the Simpkins Swim Center is, is one of the priority properties, but um, the, the parks master plan is not part of this, this plan. And then we, there's some limitations on implementation. I want to point out that that this plan does not implement specific projects and it does not fund specific projects. It gives some costing ideas and some and the framework as we talked about, but this plan itself is a plan. And so uh, projects coming out of the plan then then go through the normal development and review and budgeting process. Um, and then uh, some of the plan recommends following up with some site specific master plans. And so that's that's another, um, element that, that is a, a big potential on some of the county campuses, but is not uh, specifically part of this plan. There's also a bit in the plan about market analysis and financial evaluation. Of course, um, as you know, markets change, um, those, those assumptions can change too. It's also, it, it was a pre-COVID plan. Um, the, the concept was developed prior to COVID, but um, there could be limitations there, but based on the long-term nature of the plan, um, we're hoping that that is not a big of an impact. And we're actually uh, implementing several projects because of COVID, like the, some of the remote work um, recommendations and, and some actual lease consolidation work is actually happening um, because of COVID. And we're, we're trying to make the best of that situation.
All right, so here's our process map. Uh, this is actually part of the plan. So the, the long range uh, facility plan is a four, four step process um, in four different phases. And so we had a pretty, pretty robust project startup. We went into phase two and that's where all the workshops and departmental surveys happen. Uh, the consultant team and the key staff toured every single facility in the county that, that was part of the plan and did a pretty good assessment of that. And then we, we talked about service delivery. The departments all participated in a, in a pretty robust survey as well. And then we went into the draft plan and now uh, before you today is the final plan. All right, so this is the table of contents out of the, the actual plan itself. Um, it gives you an idea of, of the, the types of um, work that went into the plan. I'm gonna talk briefly about some of the items, um, a little bit on real property and some space requirements and really focusing though on the recommendations out of the plan today. So here's the real property section. Uh, it was quite a bit of work. We, we did a lot of background, um, provided uh, Gensler with, with everything we could possibly find out about what we own. Um, and it was a pretty, pretty interesting undertaking. Here's some of the summary facts. Um, the county owns, you know, over 2,000 uh, acres of land, which, which is it's a, it's a lot of land, uh, 1.4 million square feet of facilities, and then uh, 159 buildings. And you see in the upper left, um, that speaks about the age of our facilities. And so um, a whopping 31% are older than 1949. Um, and then, uh, most, another big chunk are um, older than 1989. Um, so that gives you a sense of some of the age of our facilities. And, um, and then the map here, it really shows, it shows how distributed the facilities are. Um, and there's some recommendations around consolidation that will come out of that, uh, that distribution. And then uh, we did look at workforce uh, distribution. And so um, there's, there's a lot of stats on the plan about that. Okay, and then this, this slide is talking about our leases. And so uh, the leases make up about 16% of the county workforce are, are in leased facilities. Um, and, and those are on the map, it shows them distributed around. Um, there's a lot of lease activity in South County. There's, there's um, also leases centralized in, uh, around the government center for the primary leases, 125,000 square feet of uh, lease space at this time. So here's the map of the priority properties and they're listed out here on, on the map as well. So there's seven priority properties. Um, it's the government center here, Emmeline campus, Freedom Boulevard campus, the Center for Public Safety on Chanticleer, Simpkins Swim Center, and then the two uh, main uh, DPW maintenance yards at Bromer and down in Watsonville at yeah, Roy Wilson. So here's an example of some of the data that was collected for our campuses and, and all of our facilities. So it's the first time we have a comprehensive look at all of our data. Um, how many staff on each site, how many staff are in each building, how large each building is, what the operations are there. So it's a, it's a really great resource for us now to have all of this information um, collected, you know, provided by GSD and GIS and all the departments in the interview. So it's really great. And we'll see this example of Freedom Boulevard carried throughout the presentation. Um, and so you can see, see how that, that moves forward. So a lot of work went into space requirements. Um, that's, a, that's a big deal is we're looking at, um, at how to use our facilities and what our projections are. So here's some of the issues we looked at uh, under, under space. So this is showing our uh, projected growth, the historical uh, staffing, and then our projected growth in staffing. Um, again, mostly from departmental interviews, so and then um, built on you know other other data from the consultant, um, and so you know we're looking at a potential increase in staffing um, over and again this is out to 2039 at this point, so um, it's it's not insignificant. And here's a look uh, combined you know with staffing, then we're also looking at at how much space we use, and so we looked at each department, each building and what our average uh, civil square foot uh, per person in each facility. And you can see it varies by, by department. Some departments are more efficient. Uh, some, some are squeezed into buildings and some have a lot of room to move. Of course, you have to look at what types of operations are done in theirs too. So it's, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one comparison, um, but it does come up with an average of 233 
uh, usable square foot per person. Uh, and then the way that that pulls forward is um, we're looking at recommendations of uh, two different standards. So for HSA and HSD, uh, we're looking at a 230, so a slight reduction. And then overall at the county, uh, 190 square foot. So that's less, obviously quite a bit less than, than what we're currently using. I think this, this uh, graphic is really interesting. And so this shows um, where we are now. We're, we're pretty high up on the right. I'm at 233 uh, usable square feet. Um, and then the recommendations are again, 230. So a reduction and then down to 190. And this shows other counties. Uh, Sonoma County, for example, is at 193. Um, County Los Angeles is, is way down at 159. And then there's some, some private uh, sector information in there too. And another variable to add into the space needs, of course, is remote work and workplace mobility. And so, you know, some of the, the studies, Gensler has a lot of experience actually in workplace mobility. Um, and you'll see a, an item coming uh, to the board uh, later on a workforce mobi mobility study. Um, and so through that uh, implementation, we could look at uh, significantly reducing uh, the required usable square foot uh, even more. So into the recommendations, um, it's divided into sort of the portfolio recommendations and then some recommendations around uh, priority properties and then some, some surplus properties. So here's sort of the, the big six portfolio recommendations. Uh, consolidating the real property portfolio is number one. It's, it's, um, it's really, um, you know, we can use a lot of work. It's developed over time without a real plan. And so there's a lot of uh, potential there. And then number two is the support housing development. Uh, there's a lot of uh, potentially vacant land that the county owns. And also that would also go into supporting housing development, not on county. And then um, recommendations around workplace quality, uh, collaboration between departments and between employee groups. And then uh, overall recommend recommendations around safety and security at cam county uh, workplaces, but also for um, making sure our service Delivery points are safe and secure for our clients. And then uh, supporting flexible work. So here's a look at one of the, uh, one of the recommendations. And you, you'll see here, um, it's really talking about trying to be more efficient with, with the land and the, the facilities that we have. Um, some ideas over in the recommendations, um, eliminating leases. So lease consolidation is, is a big part of this. You'll see the list, the leases listed there. Um, these are our main leases that, that when we talk about lease consolidation, these are the big ones. Um, collating, co-locating customer service, uh, one-stop shop came up a lot um, and, and potentially that could be more one-stop shop opportunities in South County as well, so that all the services aren't necessarily uh, located at the government center. And sharing counters. And then the fourth on, on recommendations is it's possible that there are some, some strategic acquisitions that we could do. Um, that would better serve the county um, in terms of facility and location. And then, you know, if a consolidation can happen around that effort um, is, a, is a big potential. Here's one of the housing development, the other recommendations. Um, uh, this is important because what the plan identified is that there are um, unused or potentially more usable land um, owned by the county that could be used for housing development. Uh, what, what model that would take would, would you know, need to be determined, but about uh, over 18 acres of land either not currently used or that could be used uh, more efficiently. And then that would be looking at uh, the county on land, but also talking about opportunities to uh, have more, more support uh, with, with some community partnerships. So here's a recommendation example out of the priority properties. Again, this is Freedom Boulevard that we saw before. Um, and so here, what, what we're seeing is some recommendations on uh, potential uh, surplus um, land, and then some ideas for how the site could be developed. And again, keep in mind, this is a long-term plan. So we have a lot of folks working here on this site. There's a lot of services on the site now. So um, this is not, not an immediate proposal, but, but it does make more efficient use of the site. 
And Freedom Boulevard in particular has a lot of really, really old buildings on here. And we have a lot of maintenance issues. Uh, BSG is continually struggling with, with keeping some of these buildings going. Um, and so we're looking at, you know, this site is really interesting. You know, we have some newer buildings, older buildings. There's a lot of potential to, to go a little bit taller, be more efficient, be more efficient with parking, and then potentially have some surplus property either as a sale or as a partnership opportunity for, for housing uh, development, um, something like that. So that's an example there. And then there's uh, actually two properties were identified as, as potential surplus properties. And again, this would, this would need more uh, consideration by the board. Um, and so there, there's one came up on Prather Lane. Um, this is in Live Oak adjacent to the Winkle Park. 1.9 acre site there. And then there's a, the county owns a property down on the Esplanade in Rio Del Mar um, adjacent to the, the recent um, fire that happened on the, the facility at the corner there. So that was bought by the county. It's a small site. There, there are development issues there, um, but um, there has been interest in the site. And so again, that's, that's the second um, surplus property. So here's a, here's a little look at the implementation guide. And so th this is the, the uh, 20 year plan here. And then in the plan, it gets a little bit more detailed about um, in five year increments. And so you're, what you see here is, is a lot of phasing. You know, it gets really complicated really fast, if, especially if you're talking about demolishing and building new buildings that we have existing employees and service um, coming from. So um, some of the arrows up and down are linkages. So if we're moving folks out of one building, is there swing space they need to go into? When you demolish a building, then you build a new one and, and who's gonna move into there? Um, so that stuff is, is pretty exciting. It does get really complicated really fast. So, um, and that's where again, support from potentially a, a, a more detailed uh, campus site specific master plan uh, would, would be able to better inform that and then combine with, with our lease consolidation effort. So the last section of the plan was a financial uh, evaluation. We looked at occupancy costs and some capital costs. But real quickly here, um, the, the, the second box um, is, is again, free, uh, the uh, Freedom Boulevard campus. And then uh, what we did is we, we had the, um, the, the recommendations actually costed out. And you can see they, they, they get very expensive very fast. And so um, this is why we wanna make sure that we know what we wanna do, uh, we know how we wanna use the, the sites the most efficiently and then, um, and then follow that up with, with more detailed costing. Um, but again, this is a long-term plan. So um, uh, it, it, we do have some strategic decisions to make there. And then this is a little bit more detail on that same site. So this is coming from the appendix actually and how some of the costing models were developed. And then you see here at the bottom that 100, 179 uh, million again, and how those carry forward to uh, the development. So the, the concept here was, was building quite a bit at Freedom Boulevard. Again, that, that needs to be seen um, if that's the best thing to do or not. Uh, okay, so here's some next steps. Um, we have a lot of act activity in this area right now. So we are actively working on these consolidation. Uh, we've had one lease um, already that, we, that we've um, slated for, for moving um, out of a lease facility. And then you'll see uh, coming to the board February 23rd, a wor workforce mobility study and space planning. And that's primarily focused on the leases that are in South County, um, as well as one lease in, in the North County that's, that's close to the government center. And that will be looking at how to implement uh, the remote uh, work within those individual uh, departments. Um, there'll be a robust uh, survey and then some detailed space planning and what, what that information looks like in terms of what space uh, needs are at the time. And then you'll also see February 23rd, the Bromer Yard Master Plan coming before you. That was one of the prior, primary um, properties, priority properties and Public Works um, has gone ahead and, and done a conceptual master plan for that, for that property. And then surplus properties, again, we, we went over those two properties and we're hopeful to come to the board uh, you know, in spring and summer and, and start looking at some direction on, on those properties. And um, th there's, there's potential, of course, for more campus master planning, um, especially as things move around with, with lease consolidation, um, possibly down at Freedom Boulevard. And then there's active work 
being pursued by GSD on the fourth floor space planning uh, concept, you know, to make make uh, our 701 building here a little bit more efficient um, and and be able to serve serve the public better. And then there's ongoing work at Suite B. And again, these GSD projects that are coming forward are um, are now being undertaken in, with the idea that that everyone has really increased their communication when we're talking about capital capital facilities and construction and what kind of maintenance happens um, with, with sort of a new, um, less siloed approach and, and more communication. So we all know going forward, hopefully we can all work together and, and make things happen um, in a more, uh, more comprehensive manner. And then there's some recent policy development going on too around capital facilities. And to the extent we can, you know, incorporating obviously the, uh, the uh, strategic plan, but also the long range facility plan and, and other strategic Departmental uh, strategic plans into capital facility um, decision making, and so our recommendation today is to accept and file the long range facility plan, and that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kerry, for a very thorough report uh, and much needed. Um, I'm going to make a couple comments and then uh, ask the board before we go to the public. Um, uh, this is a long time in coming. Our original uh, long range facilities plan was done in 1994. Now, that doesn't mean the county hasn't been doing anything for the last 27 years for sure. But uh, I think it's really very, very timely for us to get an update. Uh, I really appreciate the efforts that have gone into creating this property um, inventory and evaluation the changes uh, needed based on our community's needs. Um, among the recommendations outlined in the staff report, I'd like to highlight three that I think are most critical, that we make every effort to identify how our properties could be used to make housing more affordable and to increase overall supply. And this could be controversial, as you said, the, the housing needs are I think 10,000 units by 2029, which is not very far away, but you can, there'll be a lot of pushback for people concerned about traffic issues and, and water, and, and, and uh, adequacy. So it's, it's going to be um, interesting how we address this, but it needs to be addressed because we do know we have some housing needs. Um, also, I appreciate the effort to identify where some of our county services are not very accessible to certain communities. Uh, and of course, I would like to include the San Lorenzo Valley in that in my district and ask that we include that part of the county in our efforts to create a new service hub of some sort. Um, and I want to underscore the benefits of our remote work policy uh, and the positive impact it can have on our health and well-being for our employees, as well as uh, reducing traffic and parking needs. Um, the largest carbon footprint in this county comes from our employee commutes, so we can address environmental uh, objectives as well as we are going for government service needs uh, at the same time. And I'm sure I and others will have more questions uh, when specific projects come, come up uh, as of this summer, I, I, I take it. Uh, but I, I really wanna thank our CAO for leading this effort and to really diving deep into what we have, what we need and where we can uh, be more economically um, responsible and really more importantly, have, uh, provide better services to more people in the county uh, in a very, very environmentally uh, sensitive way. So uh, those are the couple of the comments I have, but I, I think it's a tremendous uh, presentation that's well needed uh, at this time. And I would invite uh, members of the board if they have uh, any comments. Uh, I'll start I'll start with Supervisor Friend this time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Carey and Mr. Detlefs for the, your thorough project that clearly has you know, it took, was even more difficult over the last year for a lot of reasons associated with COVID. You know, there are a few comments I'd like to make. For the, the first one to echo uh, what Chair McPherson said is that uh, this is an essential project or process that we're going through. And um, and, I, and I hope that it's clear that, that the goal here isn't to just have a, a plan that sits on a shelf, but to really be actionable over the next five and 10 years. But I, I read uh, the report in a way um, that I'd like to highlight a couple of things. You had a graph in there that talked about where employees lived versus where they worked, for example, that really did show that functionally, uh, most of our employees live in the Mid and South County, but all work up North. Uh, so the degree that we can shift the overall services to the Mid and South County, including the, the government buildings that way, I think makes sense long-term. I mean, speaking to 
Supervisor McPherson's point, the county is the second largest employer in the county behind the university and does have a responsibility in regards to uh, traffic, environmental issues, and, and quality of life to address this in a way that, that we can. And I think that one of the easiest ways to do it is just to realign where our buildings are physically located. But with that said, um, there was uh, additional data in there that showed on, on more of a, of a national side that our consultants found about 12% of people would support a permanent remote work situation. Um, setting aside for a second, obviously some positions that are field positions clearly aren't conducive to remote work. Realistically, I think that the county needs to more aggressively pursue options that allow for permanent remote work options. Uh, we're not going to be able to, even if we were to realign services toward where people live in the Mid and South counties and the more uh, relatively affordable but still astronomically priced areas within our county, you know, people are still going to need to be uh, living out of county or in some cases uh, uh, even multiple counties away currently in order to afford housing and be able to work for the county. And we need to be able to accommodate those situations. People shouldn't have to be commuting two or three hours in as many of our, or actually a decent number of our employees have to do. Uh, we're probably not going to be able to build the amount of affordable housing that's going to be necessary to truly address this problem, especially in the near term. Uh, so I would like to uh, be planning more for even future workforces. I mean, we, we survey a current workforce, but we're not necessarily thinking about the employees that we're going to be hiring in five, 10 or 15 years and the fundamentally different environments that they grew up with, both in the educational and work environment. I mean, we need to be accommodating what their perceptions of the work world will be, uh, both from a remote work and transportation standpoint. So I think that it's, it's in the county's best interest uh, to more aggressively look at, at how we can accommodate remote work options. It's in the county's best interest to see how we can realign services to the south and east in our county because of both where our employees live and also those that are consuming services uh, where they live. And I think that that will also, uh, A, it will reduce costs to the county overall. B, it will improve the quality of life for the employees. And C, I think long term, it'll improve even on the retention and recruitment of future employees because they'll have more flexibility associated with it. Um, it's, it's overall where uh, uh, most work worlds, at least in the professional side, are going. And I think that we need to, if we're going to do a plan, we just need to more aggressively get out ahead of that. This plan does, it, does talk about this, uh, Mr. Kerry. I just wanted to say that, that in my opinion, we need to, to be even more focused on how that will apply uh, moving forward. Uh, I, again, I appreciate what you and Mr. Detlis did. This really is, is uh, setting the stage, I think, to improve customer outreach to our constituents moving forward, as well as improve employee conditions moving forward. So I appreciate both of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coonerty, or Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So yeah, I just wanna um, sort of build a little bit on what uh, both Chair McPherson and Supervisor Friend just mentioned. First being, um, it's, it's incredibly important that we catalog and better manage these assets. These are the people's assets uh, and um, they have tremendous uh, opportunities and also tremendous costs. And if we don't pay attention to them, um, we lose the opportunities and, and increase the costs. The, um, to, to build on what Supervisor Friend said, I said, I think first we have to remember um, that we are in the service delivery business. And the best way that we can deliver services is ideally um, we're not requiring people to go to any physical spot uh, to automate or digitize um, various services that, that we provide um, so that they aren't, uh, they don't have to take time off of work or drive across the county or get childcare. And so making sure that we have a user focused um, uh, approach to our delivery system is incredibly important. The second optimal uh, thing to do for our users is to uh, make sure that we are uh, close to where they are so that, um, so that it's easy to access whether it's in San Lorenzo Valley or in South County or Mid County. And so I wanna make sure that uh, as we um, develop these plans, we have a user center focus. And then as Supervisor Friend just talked about, you know, um, reading this report, read a little bit. I know uh, Gensler did the, did the work for Plantronics about 15 years ago. And I didn't see a lot that had changed in sort of how they approach the workspace 
and um, the realities. And in part, this is because it was done, I think a little bit before COVID, but um, the more aggressive and forward thinking we can be um, uh, to allow people to, to live and work uh, more flexibly and to provide services more flexibly, I think it, it helps reduce costs, it helps uh, reduce impacts on our environment, it provides better service to our customers, uh, and it allows for recruitment and retention of, of good employees. And so um, I really think that I'm looking forward to us being, you know, a leader in that area. Um, and then finally, just two sort of comments um, to, to, that go to this specific plan. The first is, um, you know, I think five out of the six buildings at Emmeline uh, are talking about being demolished uh, and, uh, and, and rebuilt. Um, let me just say, if we were looking to, to locate health and human services somewhere in the county, Emmeline is probably the last place we would choose to do that. It's not accessible via public transportation. Um, there's no adjacent services uh, uh, nearby. Um, so I hope that when we look at that uh, property that we aren't just rebuilding what was there for the sake of rebuilding, but that we're actually thinking about how, to do, how do we deliver health services and human services in the most effective way possible. And if I'm looking at, you know, creating the kinds of housing that we want, um, that's that, that would be a more appropriate spot for housing um, than the provision of services. And so I think making sure that we're really thinking about that. And then lastly, I really want to, um, you know, there are um, some proposals in here that are pretty intensive uh, for the areas. And we want to make sure that we are clear to the public that uh, by adopting this, uh, we won't be moving forward on any of these specific master plans uh, until there is, you know, outreach and a vote and uh, discussion with the, with neighbors and people about how best to deliver it. Um, that this is a this is a conceptual approach and a study, um, but that um, before we implement anything, there would be there would be a lot of discussion. But I really want to make sure that we're bringing our users into it and we aren't building something that's to the benefit of our departments versus to the benefits of regular people who are coming in. Uh, you know, I guess the last analogy I'll point out is, you know, I watched, especially pre-COVID, uh, people wander around the first floor of the county building and the idea that they have to go to one office to pay their property taxes and another office to get their marriage license and another office to register to vote and a different office to, to get assessor's information. Uh, if I'm a regular person, I wanna walk in and just have those services all in one place and figure out how to um, how to get what I need, uh, ideally without even having to come to the building. But if I come to the building, um, you know, having each department set up for its own needs rather than for the customer's needs uh, is, uh, I think, uh, you know, something we need to change and can improve on going forward. Thank you, Mr. Kern uh, Supervisor Kearney, Supervisor Caput. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'll let me lower my hand. There we go. And uh, yeah, thanks, Travis, uh, for the report. How you doing? Great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, when I was looking at, uh, I don't expect an answer now, but maybe we can. Uh, you can look it up. Uh, land owned or controlled by the county, and uh, that's where we come into the Pajaro River, South Sequoia's Creek. Corlinas Creek, uh, there's always confusion about who actually controls uh, from what point of the, uh, the water in the, uh, in the river and the high water mark and uh, the property next to the high water mark. And uh, that the city of Watsonville supposedly has some where the river goes through the city area. The county, we have also uh, responsibility uh, of uh, a certain portion. Uh, and we, we always, uh, with control comes responsibility. So what I'm getting at is if um, uh, we get calls here, if somebody threw a mattress or a sofa uh, by the creek, then it comes down to, does the state of California have uh, control over that? They do have some control. <laughs> And then also the federal government, but uh, when when does it come? Where is a specific line that I've never seen 
where we have to go out there and actually take out that uh, mattress or sofa or garbage that was dumped over there. But that's for something that we can look at later. So control and responsibility, I guess, are the two key words. And then uh, Grimmer off of uh, Bullahan. Uh, I know that uh, the buildings there, a lot of them need uh, some work. Is that that would be on a lower priority list? Uh, no, that that site it was referred to in the plan as as Wilson Yard, Roy Wilson Yard. Um, that is one oh, of the priority properties, one of the seven. Um, and it's it's uh, there's some recommendations for that site. It's definitely one of one of the more important sites for public works and potentially for more use by the county in the future. Okay, and then uh, lastly, uh, Freedom Boulevard campus. Uh, uh, we, we've been looking at this uh, the entire time I've been on the board and they've been looking at it for probably 20 years before that. So yeah, it's a long, uh, it's you know time to do something there. Uh, and what I what I had, and I think the plan uh, does include a small area for a uh, neighborhood park, a uh, small a mini park, maybe with some uh, swings and uh, you know, I call them sandboxes from the old days, but anyway, uh, for kids that can play uh, the neighborhood off of Crestview and that area that they can go and use it. Is that is that included in what you're looking at? Uh, well, at this time, the plan is really, it's, it's pretty, um, it's pretty elevated view of it. It's looking at, you know, what we have now, what could potentially be there in terms of development and, and what the potential is, but, but particularly on that site, um, this project did, uh, did, you know, um, want to do a, a master plan for that site. And I would, I would still recommend that depending on, on what we see happening with lease consolidation in the South County. Um, because I think that might change, you know, some of the recommendations on that site. But I would think any major decisions on the larger sites should be really followed up with a, a more in-depth analysis and planning of, of how things have changed, what we really need um, at the county, using the concepts and recommendations from the long range facilities plan, but looking at our current situation and, and what projects have, have happened um, since the plan and and where we see you know other projects going forward. So really details about like a park on a site is something that will come up in future planning efforts. Yeah, I, I just don't want it to be forgotten. And, and I'm not talking about a big uh, park in that area because I know uh, that's where the mental health uh, uh, offices are and that's where a lot of, uh, you know, health services uh, nurses and everything. Uh, I know there's a lot of need to uh, have space for that, but uh, neighborhood park would be nice. Uh, and when I'm talking about a park, I'm not talking about more than a maybe a quarter quarter of an acre, a small park. <laughs> okay. And uh, that's about it. Uh, and you know, we'll uh, we'll talk maybe about the responsibility by the. South Sabuenis Creek, Carlinas Creek, uh, Pajaro River. And uh, good luck, you. if you can figure it out, you can do better than I am. Because every time I call, the state says, oh no, that's your responsibility. And then I call federal governments closer towards the ocean where the river runs into the ocean. But uh, And then that's city of Washington. So who's responsible? Yeah. Good points. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Koenig. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, and I also want to thank Mr. Kerry and Mr. Detliff uh, for this fantastic report uh, and the CEO uh, for having the vision to put it together. It's incredibly helpful, especially as a new board member, to be able to come in and get this really uh, overarching view of uh, our county facilities uh, and have a sense of where we're going in the next 20 years as far as moving uh, departments around to be more efficient and how to use our space more efficiently. Um, I, I think what Supervisor Coonerty said is, is spot on, that we really need to focus on service delivery. Uh, Mr. Kerry, of course, you started with that as well, service delivery as, a, uh, as being a primary part of this study. Um, and so my questions actually are, you know, how do we begin to make some of those incremental changes as quickly as possible? Uh, one of the things that jumped out at me, I know it's been a, a goal for our county to create a one-stop permitting shop as quickly as possible. 
Um, and uh, I noted that there was some, uh, you know, the current plan is to stand that up at the, um, at the, at the sheriff's uh, center over on Soquel Avenue. Uh, I also noted that it was the most inefficient use of, of space we have today at 378 square feet per person. Is that just because of the, you know, the fact that we have, that, you know, the sheriff needs to keep vehicles there and, you know, other operations um, up, uh, along with that? Or is it actually, are there, um, you know, is there a good opportunity to more efficiently use space there? Um, at, at the sheriff of Chanticleer site, I, I would say that's, um, it is at the top of the list, but the sheriff does have, they do have normal office type uses there, but they also have a lot of specialty areas. Um, there is some potential, I know that, that they're looking at some for future improvements um, for sheriff uh, uses uh, in that, in those buildings. It is a large site, they're large buildings. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that that's, um, that's a problem at this point without maybe a little bit more look at it. That's the data, that's how it comes up. But again, the sheriff has a lot of uses that are very untraditional. They're not all office uses. And so when we look at specific sites and specific buildings and departments, we need to be careful about apples to apples comparison because um, the sheriff, for example, has you know the, the uh, morgue um, is, is in that facility. Um, there's a lot of other, you know, specialty inspections, and they have a lot of staff that requires specialty support, like locker rooms and, and that kind of thing. And so, um, it, it's 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 a measure of the building efficiency, but you have to be careful making those comparisons um, there. So I think there is potential on that site um, to do to do more work, I think, and, and potentially more consolidation and offer more services there. Um, but but um, that's yeah, we just have to be careful. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I get it. Uh, it would also be great to just, you know, really do some kind of a trial there in terms of service delivery. Uh, you know, even if it's using one of the public uh, public rooms while we're in COVID and we're not gathering as a public uh, to provide a one-stop permit shop, um, just, you know, even on a three-month trial basis, um, I really think that we need to be innovative in terms of our service delivery and uh, try to use some of the spaces uh, for that. I know I'd be happy to office uh, or offer the, uh, my office uh, at the Sheriff Center today towards that, that purpose um, and furthering that end. The other question I had, you know, um, you know it's, it's interesting to see that your um, probation is leasing an office right across the street from the county building. And of course, um, there's a lot of efficiencies, uh, the county building, building, I mean, 701 Ocean, uh, a lot of efficiencies we can um, create right here in this building. Um, I'm curious, you know, I saw the $68 million figure for renovating 701 Ocean. Is there any way we can take a more incremental approach to that? Um, you know, the, the open office floor plan uh, so we're with a more focused public space, eliminating the interior um, loop design. Uh, I thought that was a great diagram in the study. Um, can we, is it possible to do a, a single floor move in um, uh, probation and the public defender's office and, and eliminate some of those leases. Can we start saving money in an incremental fashion like that? And what would the payback period be if we just did one floor and then we're able to eliminate some leases? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there is a current project sort of in, in the, the mid planning phase right now um, being led by GSD that's, that was specifically looking at the fourth floor. Um, and, and the reason for that was, was focusing on the one-stop uh, shop for permitting services and how to more efficiently combine uh, planning and, de and Department of Public Works services uh, around permitting. Um, and so, you know, improvements to the lobby and, and, and that. And so that project, um, as far as I know, is, is not funded. Um, and so we, we would need to look at funding. Unfortunately, we don't have, you know, funds set aside for all these um, projects that we'd like to do, but that's a good example of a project that is incremental. Um, it would provide more efficient use of 701, and and the discussion was um, if if we can learn a lot from that um, type of activity, and then we could we could potentially um, implement some of the the more public facing services on the ground floor. Was something we discussed with Gensler and and a lot of the department departments when we had the interviews. Um, so that, that gets to uh, Supervisor Coonerty's, you know, comment about having to roam around the building looking for services when we could potentially have more uh, easily accessible public counters. Um, 
but but you know this building is old. Um, when we start talking about remodeling, there's only plumbing in the middle and, and things like that. And so it's it's a bit of work. Um, there is a scope of work ready to to um, you know really look at seriously um, with with GSD. And so you know that's a good example of, of a project. Um, and then the intent of that was to consolidate maybe some of the other departments in 701, make use more efficient, and now potentially implementing remote work. And we have discussed examples of, you know, bringing in some of the, the North County leases in, into 701, if we can make more, more room uh, available. Um, yeah, okay, so that makes perfect sense. Um, just to like give or, or ask more specific question, do you have some sense of how much it would cost to do a, a lightweight renovation of one floor? Um, I, I'd have to get back to you on that. I think that, that, um, again, that project is led through GSD. And so I know they've, they've mm. gotten some, some, some initial costs out there. Um, they're ready, I think, to, to move forward with a, with a planning consultant contract, and that would be for design services. And then that, that would then really allow, you know, the departments to work together and figure out what we really want to do. And so that's kind of an iterative process. So we, we would come up with a first phase with a design consultant and then how to implement, you know, all the changes we want to make. And then from that plan and then move forward into more detailed architect, architectural plans and then costing for that. And so that, again, would also be an incremental step. But I think it'd be an exciting um, project to look at because it would give us an idea on, on, on what we can do. And, you know, if we're concerned with cost, obviously, then perhaps there's some phase, phase, phasing that we can look at to, uh, to start implementing something like that. Yeah, like I said, I'd love to be able to compare that project cost to, for example, how much we're paying for the lease at 303 Ocean for probation and say, you know, if we can say, hey, we pay this off in, you know, seven years, um, you know, that'd be great to get an understanding of that. Um, kind of looking at that side of the street, I was, uh, of Ocean Street, um, is there another, I mean, I understand that there's a, um, you know, when you start talking about the, the main jail and other probation facilities, there's a, quite a few more properties there. Um, main jail is on 5.6 acres, also more or less in the heart of, of downtown. Uh, I know in discussions with uh, our sheriff, he said that it is a priority to try to renovate that facility uh, or you know, construct a new one because it's, it's very old and um, you know, doesn't provide good service to um, the folks that we detain there. Um, is there a, alternative is there you know does an alternative study already exist that considers you know long-term facility planning for um for detention services or is that contemplated in the future so as i noted th this particular plan does not consider detention facilities um i know that the sheriff is is very concerned about that particular site and and uh, the long-term nature of that site um i can tell you that that what what was hopeful um, when we're looking at the two uh, subsequent phases of this project going into site-specific master planning, particularly on the government center, um, we did start having preliminary discussions about not just this property uh, at 701, but across the street, the jail property, and then, you know, tying in the, the uh, adjacent leases as well. And um, because it's, if we do a really intensive master planning, we want to make sure we do cover that issue. Um, there's, there's different ideas that came up over there and, um, you know, how to more efficiently use this site as well as that site. I think any uh, future master plan uh, really would take into account that facility because it could, it, as you mentioned, it is a large piece of land over there as well. So um, that, that should definitely be considered. Got it. So you're saying that will, when we do a master plan for 701 Ocean, it would also uh, include looking at the main jail site across the street. That would be my recommendation, yes. Got it, great. Um, and I suppose the, the final thing I um, wanna mention is you know, just as, as we look uh, at, you know, sort of the uh, potential surplus side of this property here at 701 Ocean or the Emmeline campus or, or other locations, um, I you know, I'm interested in seeing a public-private partnership where we do retain 
some ownership in this in this property rather than simply selling it off. I mean, we've we've seen a 10 percent increase in property values in this county just in the last year alone. Uh, you know, if we sell this property, we're never going to get it back. I think that you know, as far as managing the public's assets, uh, probably one of the best things we can do um, is is uh, grow those assets in um, in a way that uh, ultimately returns you know the highest rate of return to the public. Um, and I think that we're going to get that if we maintain uh, maintain ownership or some portion of it. That's it. Thank you. Uh, good questions by everybody. By, and for information, GSD has been referred to the General Services Department, which oversees uh, the, uh, the the physical plant of uh, the county. Uh, I just have one more question before I ask for some public comments uh, to Mr. Palacio. Some. This is a huge uh, multi-million dollar uh, program and we know it's gonna take a lot of time, but in general, what are some of the funding opportunities? I mean, I know that the public partner, uh, private partnership could be one which was mentioned uh, by Supervisor Koenig and others. Um, what, I mean, does the federal or state, um, everybody says, oh, just get a grant and you can build it. Well, they're not easy to come by. And, uh, but uh, are there some specific, pro uh, opportunities or what do you see as some ways we can get at this? And we're not gonna be able to build this in a long, long time if we rely on our general fund surplus, if there ever is one. Uh, what, what do you see are some of the main opportunities we might have to uh, fund uh, some of these projects? Uh, yes, uh, Chair McPherson, there are a number of opportunities that we have uh, ahead of us. Um, for example, if we were to consider a mixed use project that involved affordable housing, um, there are some funds available for affordable housing, both at the federal and state level. Uh, one of the obstacles has been in, in uh, obtaining those funds, there's a couple of obstacles. One has been uh, a siting it. That's probably been the biggest obstacle. Where do you put a, uh, an affordable housing project at? That's always been a big obstacle. And then the second one is that there's typically a re requirement for a local match. Uh, we used to use redevelopment uh, before it was eliminated uh, under Governor Brown. Um, it was a very important source of um, affordable housing uh, funds at the local level that we used to use as match for both federal and state funds. And so that source is now, you know, is gone. So finding uh, that local source of match, uh, we do have an impact fee at the county that we implemented a few years ago, but it's it only has a very limited number of funds. We have some remaining uh, redevelopment affordable housing that have been almost all committed already. So that is gonna be one of the challenges, just how do we find uh, that local match? I know that one other way to do it is with this public-private partnership. And that way you would create some kind of um, mixed use where you would have market rate and affordable housing in the same project and then use the market rate to in effect be the local match for the affordable housing project. And we, we will definitely explore that. We have done that in the past. I know uh, that has been a model that some jurisdictions has per have pursued and we definitely view that as an option. Uh, other sources of funding include special grants for both uh, behavioral health facilities, uh, health facilities uh, as well, that oftentimes there are federal sometimes state grants for actual this clinic facilities. For example, we have been able to build um, the new behavioral health center, remodel our health clinics, all using uh, specialized, uh, some grant funds, but also uh, our own uh, source of health funds that we get from the federal and state governments. So those are another source of, of revenue. Uh, so, and then of course, we already are paying a lease revenue many times out of the general fund and dedicating uh, those funds to our own building as opposed to paying lease funds is another way, way to do it. I think that um, COVID um, crisis has been a you know, great tragedy for uh, our country and, and the world, but one of the uh, silver linings is that it has really forced us to rethink the idea of office space and, and remote work. And so that also gives us an opportunity to potentially consolidate, save money, on funds uh, that we are currently paying towards lease and use it to uh, potentially remodel or rebuild uh, new buildings. So the whole uh, remote work revolution is something that we can definitely take advantage of and, 
and see uh, how it can benefit us in terms of being more efficient in our use of space. So there, there's a lot of different spaces. You know, when I was in, uh, in Watsonville, when I was a city manager there, we built a new city hall and the new parking structure. We actually ended up using over 10 sources of funding to build those facilities. So that's the kind of creativity we're gonna, it's gonna require of us as well, uh, using uh, multiple sources of funding to put together a project. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that overall viewpoint. Uh, very important, well, critical, obviously. Um, are there any, um, is there any comments from the public on this issue? Um, yes, Chair, we have one speaker speaker whose telephone number ends in 2915. I will be unmuting you. You have two minutes to speak. When I, when you accept the unmute, the timer will start. Speaker 2915, you can go ahead and start. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for this report. I think it's very interesting and um, brings out a lot of uh, issues that have not been dealt with for quite some time. So I'm happy to see this done and hope, as has been expressed here, that it doesn't just get shelved. One thing that regarding the 701 Ocean Street complex that would be of immediate assistance to the public is to reinstate the public information booth. It used to be uh, at, on the first floor at the very entry. Um, people could go there and figure out where to go, and that was eliminated. That needs to be brought back immediately. That would help a lot of people that navigating and lost <laughs> in the building and would be uh, not an, an expensive thing to do. I really am curious about the... Uh, plan to sell the piece of property in the Rio Del Mar Esplanade that is next to the Seabreeze Tavern. That tavern just sold for $1.2 million and um, likely will have to be demolished because of the fire. I think it is interesting that it has been immediately rendered as surplus property at the time that this sale has gone through. And again, as Supervisor Koenig said, the county should not be selling off property that is and will become even more valuable. So uh, thank you for those good comments, Supervisor Koenig, and I do not want to see that property sold to a high uh, bidder at the hotel industry. The um, probation department should be housed and is housed in the Aptos Village Project. The county is leasing property there for probation, so why is it also leasing property <laughs> on Water Street combined? And Chair McPherson, that is the only public speaker I see who had their hand up. That's So that would be the end of public speaking. Thank you. Okay. Um, once again, I want to thank uh, Travis Carey and Peter Dedlitz for their really intense um, viewpoint in uh, this report. It's really invaluable to us for our future operations and needs for our uh, citizens of, um, of Santa Cruz County. Um, I would entertain a motion to uh, accept and file this report. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Second. Ooh, just... okay, uh, okay, we have mo I motion by friend, second by Coonerty. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Finnerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. And Chair McPherson? Aye. Passes unanimously, and thank you again for a very detailed report. Um, we will go to item number eight to consider the final appointment of Lynn Petro Petrovic to the Commission on Justice and Gender as an at-large representative of CASA for a term to expire April 1st, 2024. The nomination was accepted January 26, 2021. Do I have a motion to accept an appointment? Move approval. I'll second. Second. Coonerty, uh, Caput, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. 
Sorry, aye. Caput? Aye. Chair McPherson? Aye. Uh, now we will go to item number 8.1. And Mr. Palacios, could you repeat that? I don't have that. Uh, it's the order, the emergency proclamation. Could you just please read it for the record? Uh, item number 8.1. Yes. Uh, this is uh, to consider the adoption of a resolution establishing a local state of emergency as a result of damage to roads and other county property uh, from the January 2021 storms and take other related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. Uh, we are recommending that the board consider adoption of a resolution establishing the local state of emergency. Uh, upon adoption, direct staff to direct the resolution and forward the resolution to the governor of California with a request that he proclaim the county of Santa Cruz to be in a state of emergency. And further that the governor request a presidential declaration and request both state and federal funding assistance and inform the applicable state legislature, uh, st state legislators of the board's action. Um, this action, uh, Chair McPherson, members of the board, is a result of the storms that we experienced uh, in January 2021. Uh, we have experienced uh, significant flooding and damage to property, including uh, but not limited to Valencia School Road, White Road, Schultes Road, and Buena Vista Drive. And then there have also been other roads damaged uh, due to fallen trees, power lines, debris flow, landslides, slip outs, and flooding from rivers and creeks. Um, that concludes our, our report. And I believe um, uh, Matt Machado, uh, Deputy CAO, Public Works Director, is also uh, on the call. On the call, if uh, if there's more specific questions. Okay, I, I doubt, Mr. Machado uh, needs. Do you need to have any further comments? He doesn't okay. need to comment unless there are questions. Yeah. Okay. Any questions from the board? Uh, one question, Mr. Chair. Um, yes. I'm curious, just you know, to the uh, to the public comment we heard earlier. Um, just for clarification, why is it necessary to create a, a new state of emergency um, when my understanding is we actually are currently in a state of emergency based on even the 2016-17 storm damage? Um, so just seeking clarification there. Uh, yes, uh, it's a different incident. So each um, specific incident, uh, there's a requir requirement to uh, request a new uh, declaration of emergency. Other, and that is to uh, allow us to seek federal and state emergency funds to help us repair these uh, various roads and other <sighs> damage to the county property. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? No, uh, the only comment I'd make uh, is uh, uh, with the emergency uh, situation, if something arises be, uh, when we're not actually meeting, uh, I can't remember exactly how do, how do we respond, uh, Mr. Palacios, with uh, like when we had the uh, incident down here in South County, within hours we were, uh, we had uh, trucks from Granite Rock taking uh, uh, tons of rock to uh, bolster the levee by the Pajaro River about four years, five years ago. I, I know we did that within hours rather than having to wait to meet. I think we did a teleconference. Is that what we did or what? So there's, uh, I have the ability as the county executive to declare a local emergency uh, on my own uh, without the board's um, approval. But the board has to ratify that. Um, ratify. That's correct. Okay, now I remember. And that answers pretty much uh, uh, Supervisor Koenig's uh, uh, question somewhat. If there was an emergency and we couldn't get together, you can do it, and then later we can ratify it. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, okay. Any other comments from the board? Uh, any comments from the general public? Yes, we have one comment, Chair. There we go. Um, caller whose telephone number ends in 2915, you will have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. 
I'm I'm very curious about this, and and I actually worry that the county is crying wolf. <laughs> I I recognize there was damage, but is it does it meet the dollar amount that really satisfies declaring a state of emergency? I see in the uh, resolution that this local emergency shall be deemed to continue to exist until its termination is proclaimed by the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Cruz. So this means that any storm coming forward would also be included for optional, uh, for possible repair money. I'd like that clarified. Or would it have to only be due to the storm that we got last week, which was not actually that much damage. I realized there was damage in these certain areas, but again, on Schultes Road, is this related to the 2016-2017 damage that is now currently under bid to be repaired? I think um, it's important not to overuse this state of emergency because I think um, it could get us into trouble. So. I would like some discussion about that and um, exactly how much money does it enable us to get for these repairs? What is the process? Do we have to hire special outside consultants as we did in 2016-17 at an additional cost to the county or could that work be done in-house? Thank you very much. Okay, I think it's... um... I think it's been uh, discussed. I think everybody can hear me that you know the CAO can declare this, and we can, uh, as a board of supervisors, approve it, depending on the circumstances at hand. Uh, whenever that should happen, and we hope it doesn't happen again here. But I think uh, the CAO explained that uh, he has that option under this, these circumstances, and we we approve that. So uh, I don't think there's a, a dollar amount included in these uh, situations. It's just a, a situation if it uh, meets the criteria that the CAO believes is a state of emergency, and then we would approve it as a board of supervisors. I, I don't think we. Can, I don't know how you can go into more, more detail than that, uh, Mr. Palacios. Do you think you want to add anything? Uh, yes, we we have uh, definitely suffered millions of dollars of damage. There's no doubt about that. We don't have a firm estimate yet, but it's definitely in the millions of dollars. And so uh, relying on our own uh, local funds, that'd be very difficult to try and repair these roads. And so this would make us eligible for state and federal grants to help communities like ours when we do suffer from natural disasters, such as flooding and uh, road road slip outs and so forth. Okay, thank you. Um, We have... um... Can I, did I, I'm sorry, do we get a motion on this? Um, I don't think we have. Does anybody want a Mr. motion? Sure, I'll move the recommended actions. Thank you. Moved by Second by Coonerty. Um, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. And Chair McPherson. Aye. That brings a conclusion to our regular agenda. Uh, we will now move into a closed session. Uh, there is one item to be discussed uh, in that uh, closed session, and that's a conference with legal counsel, a threat to public services or facilities. Uh, Mr. Uh, County Counsel, do we have any reportable actions from that uh, closed session? Do you think? Thank you. Thank you. There are no reportable actions. Okay. Very well, then we will uh, adjourn this regular meeting and move into closed session. Uh, It is now about 20 minutes to 11. Uh, Why don't we take a 20 minute break? We'll meet at 11 o'clock in closed session. Um, And uh, we'll see you then. Our next meeting of the County Board of Supervisors is February 23rd, 2021 at 9 a.m. We will move now to uh, closed session. Thank you. Uh, We'll reconvene at uh, 11 o'clock.